This is the agenda for today. Uh, we will talk about the GPU and accel as an accel accelerator. You know that GPUs are originally uh, devised for processing graphics. We don't really care about that uh, side of the GPUs in this lecture. We are only going to uh, talk about the, their capability as uh, general purpose processors. And, uh, and there, um, yeah, the way that we are going to uh, organize this lecture is by first presenting what's a typical uh, programming structure when we write CUDA or OpenCL programs, which, is, which are the, the way of programming GPUs for uh, general purpose processing. And we will talk about the bulk synchronous programming model, bulk synchronous parallel programming model, what does it mean, what are its limitations. And then uh, we will talk about the... Um, uh, memory hierarchy and memory management and uh, finally some performance considerations, let's say uh, things that we have to take into account when we want to optimize programs for GPUs. This is not uh, usually not uh, trivial optimization, so that's why uh, it's interesting to talk about them and also uh, they are kind of, uh, even though we are going to be talking in particular about GPUs, they are kind of uh, uh, you know, like generic um, optimization techniques that you may also use on other platforms as well. Finally, only if we have time, we will uh, start talking about collaborative computing. This is, let's say, like new programming features that allow us to use uh, different devices uh, in a collaborative manner, working on the same uh, workload, let's say application. Okay, uh, recommended readings. Uh, the first one is uh, clearly the CUDA programming guide. Um, you will see it's a lot of uh, documents there from the um, very basics of uh, CUDA programming uh, to like very, very uh, complex, um, um, you know, uh, APIs, functions, and, and programming tricks. And if you want to read a book, there are several uh, good ones, but the one that I would recommend is uh, this one by Professor uh, Wen Mei Hu and, and David Kirk. The other day, uh, in the last lecture, uh, the, uh, I mean, there, the, we had a few more slides to cover about uh, the, you know, like uh, example GPUs, and, and this is what, what, where we are going to start uh, right now. Uh, this trend of uh, GPU programming or general purpose programming for GPUs started like uh, around 12, 13 years ago, and the very first uh, architecture was uh, called Tesla architecture. We will talk a little bit more about the uh, different architectures later uh, over the lecture. But um, yeah, this is kind of one of these first GPUs that were uh, capable of doing general purpose processing. Um, in NVIDIA Speak, this has uh, 240 stream processors. And this is SIMT execution. Recall that we talked the other day about SIMT execution. We will uh, uh, recall that uh, again today. And in generic speak, um, uh, these 200 stream processors that NVIDIA also calls uh, CUDA processors um, are actually 30 uh, cores, 30 GPU cores, or 30 um, uh, SIMT pipelines, each of them including eight, uh, eight lanes. So uh, you will see um, the detail. Actually, you can see the detail here. This is one of these cores, one of these uh, streaming multiprocessors in NVIDIA terminology. And inside each of these, we have these different lanes. You can see the eight of them. Inside each of them, we might have several uh, processing elements or several ALUs, let's say. For example, uh, we have something that is able to do multiply accumulate operations or multiply add operations that are uh, very useful for um, linear algebra, for neural networks, for example. And we may also have other ones. We can have um, uh, special units for uh, integer computation, for floating point computation, and this is also something that has uh, a changed a little bit over time in the different designs of the GPU architectures. But essentially, uh, the, the thing that we have inside one of these GPU cores is what you can see uh, in the slide. Um, yeah, so as you might remember as well, on each of these um, GPU cores, what we execute are, well, what we do is mapping 
thread blocks. You might remember that term from the uh, previous lecture. And these thread blocks are decomposed into warps. And each warp is a, a set of 32 threads that are going to run in parallel. They are going to run uh, concurrently as a SIMD unit, as a basic SIMD unit. We will uh, talk a little bit more about this today. And this is like the... Let me show you. Okay, no, wait. This is like the uh, full picture of the entire GPU, this GeForce GTX 2, um, 285. And here uh, you can find the 32 GPU cores that the uh, first slide mentioned. <coughs> and actually, the, the, um, even though the, the, let's say the basic architecture is essentially the same, it has evolved a lot in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, or 10 years, right? This, this one was released in 2009, but the first CUDA-capable GPUs were released like two, three years before. And uh, yeah, but the thing is that in the last 10 years, you can see how much the number of these stream processors and how much, what is most, more important, how much the uh, peak throughput has increased. Uh, we, I mean, it's, it's more like 30 times, right? So from this uh, GTX 285 until this uh, V100 Volt, NVIDIA Volta V100 that was uh, released in 2017 and is uh, especially devised for training deep neural networks among many other tasks, of, of course, that you can uh, run on it. And this is the Volta uh, NVIDIA V100. Uh, now observe that how much this number of stream processors has changed from 240 to 5,120. Uh, much, much uh, powerful thing. The way that they are organized is a little bit different. In the, in the, in the other GPU, we had like uh, 30 cores uh, with eight uh, SIMD functional units per core, and here what we have is 80, core, 80 cores with uh, 64 of these um, um, CUDA cores or, or streaming processors. Stream processors. Um, Something interesting also in this uh, Volta architecture, something that started actually in this Volta architecture is uh, some specialized functional units for machine learning. These are called, in NVIDIA uh, terminology, these are, core, uh, are called uh, tensor cores. Let, we'll, we'll see uh, something more in the next slide. But here, for now, what you can see is the, like the entire block diagram. Each of these Rectangles here is one SM or GPU core, and actually it's divided, as we will see in the next slide uh, better, it's divided like in four different pieces. If you count the number of SMs or the number of GPU cores here, there are 18 total. Observe that they all have access to this uh, shared L2 cache, and uh, from there you can access the memory controllers to the HVM2 memory that provides very high bandwidth, around 800 or 900 uh, gigabytes per second. Uh, these are uh, some numbers on the right-hand side about what's the uh, peak throughput that you can get in single precision, double precision, and also uh, for deep learning with these tensor cores that you can find here. Observe that this is the picture of an entire SM or CUDA core. Um, and it's actually divided, like, as you can see, like in, in four different parts, but essentially what we have in each of these parts is the same. Uh, we have an L0 instruction cache. Uh, from, from that one, the uh, warp scheduler reads instructions and dispatches instructions to, for, for the individual warps uh, onto these uh, different units that we have here. Here we have eight uh, floating points, 64 our precision uh, computation. Here we have uh, integer units. Here we have floating point 32. And these are these uh, tensor cores. What does exactly mean, these tensor cores? Well, it's something like this. For each of these tensor cores, what we're going to be able to do is kind of this computation. Observe that we have two input values. We multiply them, and then we accumulate the partial result with uh, uh, more products coming from uh, other tensor cores. 
Um, as you can see, this is, uh, this, uh, is able to do sort, sort of uh, mixed precision. We are not working with uh, a floating point, so for with a single precision or double precision floating point operands, but with half precision. This is uh, 16 bits to represent the floating point number. It is uh, like very uh, common practice in, um, in deep neural networks because with this precision is more than enough to uh, train and uh, to do training and inference in neural networks. And actually, you can have uh, what was you see here with this mixed precision because the uh, input operands are 16 bits, but the output are 32 bits, or you can also have the output with 16 bits. <clears throat> and this is more or less a, a computation that each of these tensor cores is able to do, um, essentially uh, multiplying two uh, matrices of four times four and accumulate with uh, the um, original values of matrix C. So this is A, B, and C. So by decomposing an entire matrix multiplication into many of these tiles and mapping these tiles onto the tensor cores, you can achieve like very high throughput, as you can see, which is uh, essential these days to, um, to train networks fast and in an efficient way. That is why these uh, GPUs are, let's say, like the accelerator of choice for training neural networks, even though there are you know, like other uh, architectures are, as well that are being um, designed and are being explored for the same purpose. Actually, this is more or less what this um, uh, slide is about, this food for thought. What is the main bottleneck in GPU programs? This was uh, something that I wanted to ask you the other day at the end of the, of the lecture, but we didn't have time. Uh, maybe you, uh, you started figuring out what were the, the bottlenecks in, in, in GPU programs. We are gonna talk about this today for sure. Um, about distance or course. We are talking about distance or course, like very useful or very um, efficient to uh, train uh, deep neural networks to essentially perform matrix multiplications because as you may know, uh, what uh, we do with, um, when we are uh, training, well, not only in training, also in inference, where when we are uh, running neural networks, what we do is mapping the, conv the convolutional layers among other layers, uh, as uh, matrix multiplications, and that's why we can uh, easily map them onto these uh, GPUs and, and onto these GPU cores and uh, achieve very, very high throughput. And the question here is, uh, is it possible to use these tensor cores, which are super fast and, 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 and very nice, uh, is it possible to use them for other applications? <clears throat> well, this is something that uh, some people are uh, exploring these days, trying to do, and trying to see how to uh, modify slightly these tensor cores in order to be able to uh, do uh, more computation. For example, uh, there is a very recent proposal in Micro 2019 about uh, uh, you know, utilizing these uh, tensor cores to um, execute um, sparse matrix computations as well, which is gonna be like more and more important uh, for <clears throat> neural network training. Um, yeah, another question that I wanted to ask you is, uh, can you compare and contrast GPUs uh, with other accelerators? In particular, it would be, it's very nice to compare them with uh, systolic arrays. Why is that? Because systolic arrays, and as an example of them, TPUs are like the, one of the other uh, good alternatives for training and inference of uh, neural networks. Um, I think that we might not cover systolic arrays here in this course, but if uh, you are interested, you can, uh, you can watch uh, Professor Mudlu's lecture in uh, Design of Digital Circuits. And you will start figuring out what are the differences and, and maybe you know, at some point it, it would be nice to combine uh, both uh, paradigms. Which one is better for machine learning? Try to answer that. Uh, which one is better for image and video processing? In the end, there are a lot of similarities between uh, machine learning or, yeah, in particular, uh, deep neural networks and image and video processing. Why is that? Because uh, in the end, we are working on usually uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional inputs, and the way that we operate on, end, on them is by applying filters on top of uh, these inputs. If input feature maps is the... Uh, name that we that we use in neural networks.
networks, and we will we will see how uh, we operate on these uh, on these different tiles uh, when we are doing um, GPU computing. It's something that we are going to cover in this lecture today. And what type of parallelism each one exploits? You already know what type of parallelism GPUs exploit, right? Recall that we have SIMD, and inside the you know it's the SIMD paradigm. They, they have kind of uh, vector processing, but also array processing. But we also talk about uh, fine grain multithreading, right? Recall that I had the other day uh, a few slides uh, to talk, you know, introduce briefly uh, fine grain multithreading. Yeah, these three uh, types of uh, parallelism are, are um, or these three types of uh, um, um, processing paradigms are, are inside the GPUs. We are going to uh, talk today more about the, especially the fine grain uh, multi-threading thing. And what are the trade-offs in GPUs? Yeah, everything has trade-offs in life, right? Okay, yeah, so we're going to talk about these trade-offs for sure. Recall this uh, slide, how is uh, each of these uh, GPU cores or SIMD pipelines uh, composed? Recall that I mean, and this is actually what you have seen in the previous slides. Recall that in each of them, what we have is um, one stage where we, we are fetching the instruction. This is what the warp scheduler does when goes to this uh, L0 or, or L1 instruction cache and reads one instruction and starts decoding it to issue onto the, onto, onto the uh, lanes. So we decode it, and then we have this uh, kind of uh, scalar pipelines in parallel. And each of them, so uh, uh, each of them represents one of the lanes inside, one of the SIMD lanes inside the GPU core. Um, we, we, we need to go through the, or we need to read from the register file, what are the operands of the arithmetic operation, for example, that we're going to execute. And then we have our ALUs, which are these, you, you have seen these multiply add and multiply units. And... Um, and, and then we have a, a data cache, L1 cache. From this one, if, if we miss, we will have to go to the L2. And if we also miss there, we will have to go to the uh, global memory. The DRAM essentially is called global memory in, in GPUs. And uh, yeah, and then finally the write back, uh, we will write to the, 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 the output to the uh, register file. Uh, also recall how one warp ex is executed on these uh, units. Uh, we, we, we talk about, you know, different possibilities, right, of mapping the computation on the uh, multiple lanes that we have, and it will depend on the number of lanes that we have. Recall vector processors. Uh, we might be writing uh, CMD programs where we assume that we have a certain length of the or, or, or CMD unit, and, uh, and then, um, depending on how many functional units we have, we will uh, have to uh, perform the computations in, in a different manner, right? B based on how many um, functional units we have. In case that we have one single functional unit, we can have, let's say, um, um, co concurrency in time. Uh, for example, here we have first launched the computation of A0 plus B0 and obtain C0. After that, uh, we'll, we uh, input the operands to compute uh, C1, C2, C3, and so on. If we have more of these units, we can have more of these operations in parallel. So we can have concurrency in time and in space. Um, how do these uh, SIMD lanes look? Each of these is going to be one of these uh, SIMD lanes. We may have several of these functional units, and uh, the operands are going to be provided by the register file. The register file has in total a certain size. This is the number of registers what, that we have inside each of the GPU cores, and what we do when we map the threads onto these uh, GPU cores is that we need to partition this register file and assign each of the threads as many registers as it, it needs, obviously, as long as the, we have enough registers for that. And we are also going to talk about that, about that availability of registers and how much it impacts in the overall execution of the warps. And you may also recall this one. Um, this was for an example where the warp size is 32, so we are going to have 32 warps that are going to 
execute uh, in lockstep. We are going to execute concurrently. But the way that these actually are um, uh, executed onto the lanes depends on how many lanes do we have, right? So in, the, in this example, we have eight lanes. So uh, if we need to, if we want to uh, execute 32 threads, what we will have to do is launch 8888 up to uh, 32. So in every cycle, we will start running uh, or we'll start executing um, eight threads. And this would be like the first instruction, for example, um, uh, in, in the load unit for warp zero, we execute a load instruction, and maybe here in the multiply unit, we execute a multiply instruction for warp one, uh, an addition for warp two, and again, uh, load unit, uh, warp three, warp four, warp five. This slide, very quickly, just for you to have it as a reference, because as you can see, I might be, I, well, I, I'm actually mi mixing a lot of terminology here, right? I'm, I'm talking about the NVIDIA terminology. I could also talk about AMD terminology, and then we have the generic terminology, which is what we uh, would really need to use, but it's also good that you are familiar with the uh, terminology of the different vendors. And um, yeah, this is, you know, for, for your reference. So, sir, for example, when I talk about GPU core um, is what NVIDIA calls a streaming multiprocessor. Or um, inside a, a streaming multiprocessor, what we have is uh, some what NVIDIA calls a streaming processors, and this is for us a CMD pipeline or CMD functional unit. Okay, uh, let's start talking about the um, basics of GPU programming. And the very first thing is to recall this slide that we also uh, presented the other day. What was one of the main uh, drawbacks in, uh, of CMD processing? One of the main drawbacks of CMD processing was that it's difficult to program, right? And this is, uh, you know, this is what uh, somehow with uh, bulk synchronous parallel programming models like CUDA or OpenCL, uh, we are uh, trying to, to solve or trying to tackle. <clears throat> this trend of uh, general purpose processing on GPUs, as I, as I said, it started like 12, 13 years ago. And uh, the, you know, the, the, the most interesting contribution here is that it's, it's, it's going to be easier or it's easier to program uh, CMD processors uh, with the SPMD programming model. We already discussed this SPMD programming model the other day. Um, yeah, many people say that GPUs have democratized high-performance computing because achieving the throughput, the performance that you can today achieve very easily, even in your laptop, uh, with one of these GPUs is, uh, I mean, it was like, um, you know, very prohibitive, like 15 years ago, it was something uh, that we probably couldn't only like achieve in uh, big clusters and supercomputers, but uh, these days is uh, like, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, e everyone can, can do it um, in, uh, in commodity PCs even. And they are uh, typically very good for, for uh, workloads where we have uh, very, Inner and parallelism. Of course, the, the good thing of the uh, SPND programming model is that it is also possible to uh, implement irregular workloads. It's also possible to uh, implement, um, um, you know, to, to have divergence across uh, different threads uh, running concurrently. Obviously, uh, the performance is going to be degraded, but it's uh, still possible to uh, program in them this way. And um, and yeah, so um, yeah, but they essentially are very, very good whenever we have uh, inherent and regular parallelism. And examples of that are linear algebra, that's why matrices, image or video processing, and deep neural networks. However, this is not for free. And why is that? Because there is a new programming model and we have to learn it. Um, Algorithms need to be re-implemented and rethought. That's the uh, first thing to keep into account because, I mean, if you are used to write uh, C programs, for example, or Fortran or C++, which are essentially uh, sequential computation, 
uh, yeah, most, obviously you need to find a way of uh, taking advantage of all the threats that you can have running in parallel, right? And it, that's not uh, so trivial. Good thing is that uh, there are already like uh, many uh, high or several higher level programming languages that allow you to uh, express this parallelism in a um, more um, easy way, something like uh, OpenACC, which follows kind of similar um, uh, paradigm as OpenMP. You might be more familiar with OpenMP, right? You have a for loop, and, and before this for loop, you, you just write uh, pragma on parallel for, and then the compiler will do the, the, the work for you, right? Something like that, for example, exists also for GPUs. It's called OpenACC. And yeah, for sure you can achieve uh, good performance for uh, very regular workload, workloads if uh, you know your uh, program, your computation, your algorithm is a little bit more irregular, then um, obviously it's going to be more difficult and it would be uh, better, it would be necessary to, to go and, and directly program in CUDA or OpenCL. And uh, yeah, and even though GPUs are super uh, powerful, super fast, there are still some bottlenecks. The first uh, bottleneck is the fact that uh, the GPU is an accelerator, right? And it's typically uh, connected to the uh, main system uh, through the PCI Express, or now, for example, NVLink has this uh, fast uh, kind of PCI Express that can achieve a little bit more higher bandwidth, but still, uh, is uh, like one order of magnitude uh, slower than accessing memory. And even uh, accessing memory, accessing DRAM from within the uh, GPU cores, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's also a bottleneck. Why is that? Because even though these um, memories, GDDR5, GDDR6, and HVM2, are, uh, you know, they, they, they can provide you something between 300 gigabytes per second and 900 gigabytes per second. This is still far from the peak throughput that you can achieve. And then, actually, uh, something interesting is recall uh, how I started with this GTX 285 and this uh, Volta V100. Um, if you compare both, if you check what's the peak throughput uh, in teraflops or gigaflops, that the original, I mean, the, the, the first one uh, gives you, I, I, I don't remember the exact number, but might be something uh, around 100 gigaflops uh, compared to the uh, 15 teraflops that the, that the um, V100 uh, provides. So if you compare these two numbers with the memory bandwidth of these two GPUs, you will see that the uh, ratio between them has increased meaning that now GPUs, so the cores, I mean, the number of cores and, and how powerful these cores are is, uh, is, uh, is higher with respect to the available bandwidth than it was 13 years ago. What does it mean? It means that, the, yes, the GPUs are more powerful, they have much more bandwidth, but this bottleneck is even worse 13 years later. Okay, um, yeah, this is something that for sure you, you know, but it's always good to, um, yeah, to, to recall, to remind um, what's the main difference between a CPU and a GPU. The main difference is uh, how are you using the, the area that you have in your chip. Um, and a CPU, you know that we typically have few out of order cores, uh, very powerful cores, but only a few of them. Um, and... Uh, mm, a lot of this area, a lot of this die is used for control, for example, doing speculation, branch prediction, and these uh, sort of things. And then we also have like very big caches, right? We have deep cache hierarchies uh, in CPUs. On the GPU, most of the area is devoted to cores, computing cores, typically uh, in-order uh, fine-grained multi-threaded cores. What, what we need to, uh, for you know, control, for catches, is much smaller. And yeah, actually this uh, more, let's say, corresponds to something old like this uh, GTX 285 where we didn't even have uh, L2 or we couldn't use it for you know, the, the general purpose uh, pipeline. 
Um, now we actually have an L2, but it's still the size of these caches compared to typical sizes on CPUs is much smaller, significantly smaller. Okay, and this is the uh, first slide of uh, how do we compute on the GPU, how do we offload the computation to the GPU. Three steps. First, we will usually start the computation on the CPU side where we are going to have the original data structure that we want to operate on or data structures that you, uh, we want to operate on. So the first thing to do is to transfer input data from the CPU memory to the GPU memory. Second step, performing the computation or kernel execution or multiple kernel execution. And finally, we will transfer the results back from the GPU memory to the CPU memory. So these are the basic steps, especially in discrete GPUs, which are the most common ones. Um, you know, any of these uh, laptops and also you know, especially desktop uh, computers, the GPU is discrete, is connected to the PCI Express, in the best case, connected to the NVLink. So we will always have to do uh, this thing. These days, it's more uh, more uh, frequent to find uh, system on chips where we have inside the um, uh, same chip, we have uh, integrated CPU, GPU, and maybe more accelerators, etc. And they have access to the same memory space, you know. By, and by you know by using that, we can enable many more features. And this, we, if we have time, uh, we will talk about that at the end of the of the presentation. Uh, yeah, but still, what's the problem with those uh, GPUs, integrated GPUs, is that they are usually uh, uh, much less powerful than discrete ones. And what's the uh, typical program structure? I talk about traditional program structure because that's the, um, let's say, what is called sometimes a original accelerator model that follows exactly uh, what uh, I'm, I'm explaining here, um, discrete GPU where you have or originally have your data in the CPU memory, you need to transfer it over the PCI Express bus to the GPU memory and then you start the computation. That's a, um, a traditional accelerator model and the uh, program structure for for this, it's going to be uh, something like, like that. I think that uh, you're, you have already seen this slide before. We will start the computation doing some uh, serial code or modestly uh, parallel code on the CPU side, and then we launch a parallel kernel on the uh, GPU. Um, for this kernel, we launch a certain number of thread blocks, and each of these thread blocks contains a certain number of threads. You can see them all here. When they all finish the execution, the kernel terminates, and then the control is returned to the, G to the CPU, and then uh, we might uh, launch a second kernel, kernel B in this case. Um, one uh, thing that you can notice in this slide is that uh, two terms that we are going to be using interchangeably uh, with CPU and GPU are host and device. When we talk about host, we're talking about the CPU, when we talk about device, we're talking about the GPU. Um, it's better when talking about CUDA programming or, or talking about OpenCL programming, it's better to talk about device instead of GPU because in the end, the device could be something different as well. As you may know, with uh, OpenCL, for example, you can also program FPGAs. And actually, I don't think that we will have time, but I, I have a, a few slides at the very end of the presentation because you know the, 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 the same uh, role that the um, GPU uh, can have as <clears throat> the device in, in CUDA programming, for example, uh, can be applied to an FPA in OpenCL programming. Okay, so recall this uh, single program, multiple data, or single procedure, multiple data. This is a programming model rather than a computer organization. We were talking uh, uh, the other day about this. Uh, we are going to have multiple instruction stream uh, executing the same program, uh, and each program or procedure is working on different data and can execute the different control uh, flow path. We will see how this is done, how we need to write these programs, what are the implications of doing that, what happens if we actually uh, follow different control flow paths, and we will also discuss about how, whenever it's possible, we can try to uh, avoid these different uh, control flow paths uh, 
or, 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 you know, or program them in a way that we can still be more or less efficient. Um, <coughs> CUDA and OpenCL follow, as I uh, said in the beginning, this bulk synchronous parallel programming model. This essentially means that there is no um, global synchronization inside the kernel. When I talk about a kernel, this, I think it's something that I already said, is uh, whenever we talk about a kernel, we are talking about a function that is executed on the device. Um, and the only way to synchronize all the threads that we have inside the kernel, all the threads that we have running a kernel, is by terminating the kernel. It's the only way of doing global synchronization. As we will see today, it is possible to do uh, synchronization, uh, local synchronization uh, inside a GPU core, inside a thread block, but the only way of doing uh, the global synchronization is by terminating the kernel. And why is that? There are several reasons indeed. That, uh, the main reason is that or one of the main reasons is that uh, we want to write programs that can be uh, used on any GPU. If you go to NVIDIA website or AMD website or Wikipedia or whatever, and you look for different models of GPUs, you will, have, you will see that uh, yeah, there are many different models from uh, very uh, low-end to high-end uh, devices from, let's say, two GPU cores to 80 GPU cores. And we, went, we want to write our programs once, right? So the way that we write our programs is by saying, OK, I need to perform computation on these huge matrix, and I'm going to use uh, 1,000 thread blocks. But now, the way that these 1,000 thread blocks is going to be actually executed on the hardware will depend on how, what, what's the number of cores that we have, right? So uh, we might have a kernel where we use eight thread blocks, as we have here, and depending on our device, how powerful is our device, we will be able to do something like this or we'll be able to do something like this, right? So here, for example, this is a device with two cores. That one is a device with four cores. The way that these blocks are scheduled onto the cores depends on the number of cores that we have. And actually, even though you can see in the slide that, okay, first we schedule zero and one, and then two and three, and then four and five, and then there is uh, kind of the same. I mean, they are scheduling order in this slide. We don't even have uh, that certainty. We don't, we don't really know how they are scheduled. We cannot assume that block zero is going to be scheduled before block seven. We cannot assume that, even though, yeah, it's true that typical internal scheduling of thread blocks uh, is uh, round robbing. But, and, and that's actually something that um, I also mentioned the other day at the end of the presentation, but there is no guarantee that this is like that. So if we want to make sure that these eight blocks have finished, the only way of doing this is terminating the kernel and then launching a new kernel. So if eventually we need threads in this block to use intermediate data produced by threads in this block, we will have to terminate the kernel and launch a new kernel with maybe, again, uh, eight new blocks. OK? Yeah, going back very quickly to the previous slide, uh, these are very uh, common terms. Here you have, uh, in blue, the CUDA term. In parentheses, you have the OpenCL term. They, uh, they mean exactly the same thing. When we talk about grid, we talk about the whole number of blocks that run a kernel. And when we talk about a block, uh, it's a, a certain number of threads that are going to run inside the same GPU core. Within a block, as you can see in the slide, we, they, they, these uh, threads belonging to the same block can share data, uh, ex exchange data or, or share data using uh, an on-chip memory that is called shared memory, and they can also synchronize. So this is the local synchronization that I was talking about. And then, uh, yeah, we have thread blocks or work items in the um, uh, OpenCL model. Okay. About the memory hierarchy, this is kind of an uh, abstract view of the memory hierarchy. And actually, if you observe this, uh, I mean, it's a nice picture, but uh, it's kind of a uh, mixed thing, right? Because uh, on the one hand, we have the memories, which is, let's say, something uh, like hardware, uh, like, for example, registers, shared memory, or the global memory, which is the DRAM. 
Uh, but then we also have like the software concept, right? We have the uh, entire grid, we have the block, and inside the block we have threads. But the, 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 the slide is nice because um, uh, it, it shows very clearly uh, what are the different memory spaces that threads can access, right? So uh, we have two, assuming for example, a block, blocks of only two threads. So we have these two threads, uh, each of them can access their own registers, recall the pipeline register file where we have you know, the, the different SIMD lanes and, uh, and we have the, the whole register file that is partitioned and part of this register file, certain number of registers, as many as they need, are assigned to, to the individual threads. Uh, from one thread, I can access my own registers, but in principle, I cannot access other threads registers. Uh, but they can exchange data by using the shared memory, you know? And all the threads running on the GPU can access data in DRAM, can access data in the uh, global memory. The global, I mean, the global memory is, is all this, uh, or let's say the DRAM, the device memory, is all this uh, orange thing here. Uh, but yeah, the, the, it's, it's kind of divided into, from, from the programming perspective, can be divided into uh, several parts. So for example, uh, constant memory is, uh, you know, some, the memory areas that you allocate for read-only data. Uh, global memory is like the general purpose one for read-write. And then, uh, yeah, if you want to use uh, textures, which are, or surfaces, which are typically uh, using uh, graphics programming, yeah, you can also allocate space for that, but it will be in the same device memory. Observe that this device memory can be accessed by the threads running inside the GPU, obviously, but also can be accessed by the host. And why is it necessary? Because we need to transfer input data from the host to the GPU and results from the GPU to the host. And uh, more about the traditional program structure. Now we start, uh, you know, like saying, like, uh, typical, uh, yeah, declarations and uh, function prototypes and and APIs. Uh, so we'll see um, this main function is going to run on the host, on the CPU. First thing to do if we want to do computation on the GPU side will be to allocate memory on the device using CUDA malloc. You all are familiar with malloc. In CUDA we have CUDA malloc. The syntax in OpenCL is a little bit more uh, complex, but in the end we have the same kind of thing. Observe that in this CUDA malloc, what we are doing is allocating a certain number of bytes, and uh, we, uh, we, we are going to use a pointer to access these bytes. And then we need to transfer data from the host to the device um, using this API CUDA mem copy. This is the pointer to the CPU memory, this is the pointer to the GPU memory, and one of the things, you will see it in the next slide, one of the things that we are going to have here is the total size that we are transferring, of course, and also what's the direction of this transfer, because the API is the same uh, for uh, transferring from the CPU to the GPU and transferring from the GPU to the CPU. And then we need to uh, set up the execution configuration, which essentially is how many threads do I need, how many blocks do I need. These are two numbers that uh, we are um, usually going to determine based on what's the, uh, what are the characteristics of the data structure that we need to operate on. For example, for matrix multiplication, the way that we typically map matrix multiplication onto the GPU is by assigning the output uh, the output elements to threads. So, for example, if we have, um, we need to compute on a 1,000 times 1,000 matrix, this is my output matrix, what we typically do is assigning one thread per output element of the output matrix. So, in this case, we would be talking about 1 million threads. And each of these threads is going to read one row of matrix A, one column of matrix B, perform the dot product and store the result in the corresponding element of C, right? So um, what's the total number of threads that we need for this operation is one million, right? And now these one million threads need to be divided, needs to be grouped into thread blocks, 
right? You might recall that the other day I mentioned that typical thread block sizes are multiple of 32, right? So actually, typical numbers are something between 128 and 512. So for example, if you are using 512 and you have uh, 1 million elements to compute on, what would you do? How many thread blocks you will need to launch? It's an easy calculation, right? But as you can see, uh, the way that we write the program is, uh, you know, like as a function of the, uh, the, the, the output size in this case. Next thing to do is to call the kernel. This is the kernel launch. Uh, inside this, um, um, this part, what we have is the execution configuration. So here we will have number of thread blocks that we launch. Uh, here the number of threads and then the arguments. What's going to be one of the arguments? Or, for example, in our matrix computation, what would be the arguments? At least uh, A, B, and C, right? We will usually, we usually use, so when doing uh, you know, uh, GPU programming, uh, D, we will typically use D, A, D, B, D, C in order to distinguish them from the copies that we have on the CPU side, right? Those will be typically H. And next thing is to, when we finish the computation, the kernel terminates, and what we do is transferring the result uh, from the device memory to the host memory. Now observe that the destination is this H out on the uh, CPU side. Uh, the, the source is this D out on the, on the device memory. And here we will also indicate that the transfer is from the, um, CPU, the GPU memory to the CPU memory. And we can repeat this as needed. I mean, as needed. Uh, it will depend, right? There are some algorithms that are iterative. Typically, for example, graph processing. In graph processing, we go over the graph in multiple iterations. And uh, for this of, of each iteration, we might be launching uh, exactly the same kernel. Or there might be also uh, programs using multiple different kernels. And for uh, each of the, the kernels, we will obviously have a different definition of the kernel. But in the end, uh, what we are going to do is, uh, is something similar, right? OK, uh, yeah, as you can see here on top, but also here as well, when we write a kernel, when we write a GPU function, uh, we need to qualify it with this global um, um, yeah, global, um, how is it called, a qualifier, um, to, to identify it and to distinguish it from a regular CPU function, that, that, like that float serial function that you have on top. And, uh, and yeah, and the way that uh, usually, I mean, we aren't going to enter the you know, details of compilation and, and, and these things, but for you to know, when you write program, you will see that uh, CUDA programming is very similar to C programming. Whenever you use uh, automatic variables inside your uh, program, these are going to be assigned, are going to be mapped into registers, typically. But we can also define uh, shared memory. And essentially, this is, uh, we will need to use this special word inside the kernel function, inside the kernel code. We will declare like shared and then array of certain size in the same way as, as we uh, do in, in C, for example. And inside one block, if we want to synchronize, we will use this. This is a local variable, is these sync threads. Okay, here you have like the, the exact uh, definitions of all these uh, APIs, uh, CUDA malloc, CUDA main copy. <coughs> Observe that uh, this uh, special word here, CUDA main copy host to device. This is the data transfer from the CPU to the GPU. If it's the other way around, it will be CUDA main copy device to host. And then for uh, the allocation, we have CUDA free and um, and for explicit synchronization, we use this CUDA device synchronized. Why do we, well, I mean, this is not so important, but it's interesting also to mention. Uh, why do we, or where are we going to need to use this, this CUDA, and where do we use it? We use this API in the host code. And where are we going to use it? Uh, right after, typically, right after the kernel call, in order to make sure that the 
kernel has finished the execution. And why do we need to do that? Because uh, it's the only way that we, are sh that we can uh, make sure that the kernel terminated. Why is that? Because this kernel call is asynchronous, meaning that uh, when the host code re reaches this point, what the host is doing is calling the driver and telling the GPU driver and telling the GPU driver, hey, please start running this kernel on the GPU, right? But right after that, the GPU is, the, the CPU thread is free. So it can continue computing, doing whatever, you know, like maybe arithmetic operations right after that. So if you eventually need to, um, you know, to make sure that the kernel terminated, the, uh, the specific API that you need to use is this CUDA device synchronize, right? Yeah, not, uh, not always necessary, but it's, uh, it's good to know that it, it exists. It's, as you can see, it's, um, it's not actually like these global barriers inside the GPU code that... Uh, that they actually don't exist in the um, bulk synchronous parallel programming model. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's uh, start thinking about how do we need to uh, map the computation um, in, in or inside our programs um, by you know having some uh, running example here as uh, image processing or simple processing on a uh, on an image which is a two-dimensional data structure as you know. Images have a certain height and a certain width. In this case, um, our, our beautiful image here uh, is uh, eight times eight of size. And uh, as you know, when we want to uh, refer to any of these pixels, what we typically do as it is a two-dimensional data organization, what we do is image ji, being j the row and being i the column, right? So for example, this guy here is image 2, 1, or this one is image 0, 1, and this one is image 1, 2. But how is this image mapped onto the memory? The way that this image is, is mapped in memory is uh, on a, in CUDA and in OpenCL, same as in C, pro, in C programming. Uh, it's a row major layout, meaning that the way that the uh, in, entire image is stored in memory is as a linear array, and we store row by row, right? The distance between this element and this element is kind of a stride that actually is, has the same value as the width of the image, right? So uh, whenever we are talking about uh, image element ji, it's actually in memory image j times width plus i. You see, for example, this is image zero one, so it's actually element eight times, so zero times eight plus one, or this one, image one, two. So if we want to access data, access this image inside, uh, inside the GPU code, inside the kernel, um, what, uh, what we need to uh, keep in mind is how this is actually stored in memory. The first, uh, I mean, in this slide, the first uh, way of doing it is by using one uh, one, uh, one dimensional grid. When we talk about the grid, it's the total number of thread blocks, recall, or total number of work groups. And, um, and this can be one dimensional. When it's done one dimensional, one dimensional what it means is that um, uh, our thread blocks have only one dimension, and, uh, and we're going to have a certain number of threads inside this thread block. These are some um, you know, like built-in variables that we can use inside the, let me show it, okay, inside the, where is my cursor? Here. Um, so in, inside the uh, GPU code, we can use these built-in variables. This grid dim dot x is the number of thread blocks that the grid contains in the x dimension. This block dim dot x is the number of threads inside each thread block in the x dimension, and then for both blocks and threads, we have an index, right? So this uh, block idx dot x represents the index of the block. This is the index of the thread. So for example, one way of uh, distributing this whole image uh, among blocks and threads is by assigning 
you know, consecutive chunks of pixels to consecutive thread blocks. For example, we can assign these four pixels to block zero. Of course, this is a toy example. We will typically have much bigger images and much bigger blocks, but in this case, we consider that each of the blocks is composed by four threads. So, for example, uh, these uh, four pixels are these four pixels assigned to block zero, and um, and yeah, and yeah. So this is, for example, the way that we are going to distribute these four pixels uh, across the four threads, right? So whatever computation is related to this uh, element will be done by thread zero. Anything related to this element will be done by thread one, and so on. So now, if we want to know which thread is, for example, uh, accessing this or computing on this element, what we need to use is the block index, the block dimension, and the thread index. This guy here is the pixel number 25, and thread number 25 in the whole GPU is, uh, is uh, using it for computation. In this case, uh, this would be uh, thread block number six, uh, the size of the thread block is four, and inside the thread block, uh, the, this, this, uh, so it's thread one which is going to work on it. So this is for an, an example for uh, one-dimensional uh, blocks, and this is for two-dimensional blocks, which is actually, like, let's say, more suitable for image processing, matrix processing, and so on, right? Because they are a two-dimensional organization. It's also possible to use uh, 3D grids and 3D blocks as well. But yeah, it's, it's exactly the same uh, thing here. So in this case, we have uh, two dimensions of the grid in the uh, X dimension and in, in the Y dimension. Observe that in this particular case, grid team X is four and grid team Y is four as well. And inside each block, um, yeah, we also have uh, block dim x is 2, block dim y is 2, right? So uh, the block that is going to operate on this tile of the image is, in this case, block 2, 1. And we can assign threads to each of these individual pixels, and that guy, for example, would be uh, thread index x1, thread index y0. If we want to uh, access a specific element in a specific row and column of the image, the expressions that we need to use are these ones. You see, block index uh, y times uh, block dim y plus uh, thread index y to determine what's the row here. I hope this is clear. If it's not, it will take you like 30 more seconds to uh, look at yourself. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's continue. And uh, yeah, very brief uh, review of the GPU architecture. Recall that we, we were saying, oh, compare this uh, GTX 258, uh, 285 with the Volta V100. The number of GPU cores is uh, different. The number of uh, uh, SIMD lanes inside each of the GPU cores is also different. Yeah, so this is an example. This is actually something like the, the, the internals of each of the cores of the GTX 258. 85, for example, is something like this. You can see inside this one, what we have is uh, eight of these SPs, eight of these uh, SIMD lanes. So how do we need to do to run, to execute one uh, warp of 32 threads on, on top of these eight guys? So what we will do is we have 32 threads in each warp. When this um, instruction or this warp scheduler that we have here um, launches the uh, or issues and a specific instruction for a specific warp uh, first uh, so we, we will first um, um, start the computation for the for eight threads then other th eight threads eight threads and eight threads every cycle we can start computing for eight threads right so this is uh, corresponding to the old Tesla architecture that uh, yeah started in 2006 or so 
And this is, uh, you, you already saw this um, uh, picture, that this slide the other day. Uh, this is the NVIDIA Fermi architecture from uh, 2010. In this case, observe that in total we have 32 of these SPs, 32 SIMD lanes. But actually, the way that uh, they are used is by using uh, 16 on one uh, side and 16 on the other side. Notice that we have two warp schedulers there. So we have two warp schedulers that are um, fetching instructions from the instruction cache, and they are issuing the uh, instruction either on D16 or D16. So in this case, we need two cycles to start the computation for the whole warp. You see the difference, right? Actually, more uh, modern GPUs, we directly have 32 of these. So in one single cycle, we can start the computation for them. Recall that thread blocks are mapped onto the GPU cores or streaming multiprocessors. And there, they are divided into these uh, warps of 32 threads something like this, so uh, whenever um, the warp scheduler n uh, fetches a new instruction, it's going to fetch an instruction that can actually be executed. There are no dependencies if, uh, for whatever reason, we need to wait until the previous instruction finishes to have uh, um, one partial result as an input operand of the next instruction to fetch. This instruction won't be eligible. Um, this, uh, the, the, the warp schedule internally uses a, a scoreboarding that is essentially is like a table uh, of, uh, of the instructions that are ready for execution. And instructions that are ready for execution are those uh, that have the operands ready, right? So this will be like the way of controlling the, the, the internal dependencies inside the uh, GPU program. Okay, yeah, more terminology. I think that we have already gone through uh, all this terminology, and, and here you have the comparison across the different uh, NVIDIA generations. The latest one is uh, Volta that was released, I think, either end of uh, 2018 or beginning of 2019. And, um, yeah, I'm, I, I think that there is, in tu so it's, uh, the last one is Turing. It's not in the slide. Uh, I think there is not, no, no Turing GPU with uh, this many uh, number of, uh, of cores yet. Yeah, anyway, that's not so important. In the end, the architecture is, uh, is still very similar to this Volta one, but you can see the whole evolution here and the uh, nice choice of uh, names for the different architectures, right? Okay, I think we are done with the basics. Uh, do you have any questions so far? No, everything is clear? That's great. And uh, yeah, so I think that we can start with the performance considerations and maybe we'll have a single break. Is that okay? Okay, good. Okay, so performance considerations. Um, yeah, as I said in the beginning, main memory, main bottlenecks of the GPUs. First of all, the uh, data transfers between the CPU and the GPU. Second, uh, the global memory access. In the end, it's accessing DRAM is where we have uh, most of the, I mean, the, the, we're, we're, we're going to spend most of the uh, execution cycles when we are doing GPU uh, computing. Um, for the, yeah, for the CPU to GPU data transfers, we will see how we can deal with them or how we can try to optimize them for the memory access. This is the first thing that we are going to talk about. Um, yeah, so we will uh, first talk about what's the concept of uh, occupancy, which is very important for the latency hiding mechanism that the GPU has. This latency hiding mechanism essentially is based on the fine-grained multi-threaded architecture that the uh, GPU has. And, uh, and then uh, also an important uh, consideration is how do we access uh, uh, to, to the memory. We, we, we need to have co-less memory accesses. We will see that what this means. And then uh, we will also see how to use this uh, shared memory that we have is an internal, uh, actually it was in the, let me go very, very quickly back. So it's, it's right here, it's uh, this shared memory that Actually, maybe not in all GPUs, but it's typically the same memory space that the L1 cache as well, uh, and is internal to the stream processor or, or GPU core. So that's why uh, all these uh, units that we have here can access this shared memory. It's uh, a scratch pad on chip memory. 
it's, it's kind of uh, software uh, programmable cache. It's, it's, it, its role is to, to, to act, to be, to, to be used as a cache, but it's uh, something that the programmer can explicitly manage. It's not like a regular hardware cache where you just uh, let the hardware work and, and don't have to worry about it. Here, you, you can control it explicitly. Okay, so we will see how to use it. We will also uh, go back to something that we actually uh, started to discuss the, at the end of the lecture the other day, is the divergence in, inside the, a warp, how to deal with this. We will also talk about atomic operations, with this, which is one of the uh, sources of inefficiencies in the thread execution inside the GPU because we need to have a serialized execution, especially in the cases where two threads that are running concurrently need to update using an atomic operation the same uh, element in memory. And, uh, yeah, and finally, we will see uh, what we can do for the data transfers. Okay, so let's start with the memory access. Um, yeah. So as I said, uh, GPUs are uh, fine-grained multi-thread architectures. Um, uh, uh, here, the multiple threads are actually multiple warps. And what we do is that uh, we can have warps executing, running on the cores, on the CMD lanes. And these guys can somehow hide the latency of, the, uh, of other long latency operations, like, for example, accesses to the global memory. So very uh, naive toy example here. Uh, if you have, let's say, four active warps inside uh, a GPU core, uh, you can start, you can be running um, or executing instructions for the different warps, for example, instruction three for warp zero, instruction two for warp two, and so on. And, and suddenly, uh, warp zero needs to execute this uh, instruction four, which is an access to global memory to read an entire cache line, for example. So, um, yeah, so what we can do is if, if we have enough warps running inside the GPU core is we can continue uh, executing instructions for other warps. Of course, for warp zero, we will likely have to stall until we get the values from, from DRAM, from the global memory, and then we can continue execution of instruction five. So this instruction five will only be uh, ready for, for issuing, eligible, as I said before, after this instruction four completes, uh, assuming that data that is uh, read from memory by this instruction four is used as an, as an operand by this instruction five. But in the meantime, as you can see, we can hide this latency. And for that, in this particular toy example, we need four active warps. What might happen if uh, we only have two active warps in this toy architecture is that at some point we have this instruction four, and then, uh, yeah, we are in the beginning we can continue with the execution of instruction three for warp one, but then um, instruction one all, uh, also needs to access memory, so we will have all this gap that we cannot hide. So that's why it's important to have enough number of instructions ready for execution, because this way we can hide the long latencies. Problem here is that, um, I mean, a uh, typical way of, of, of having this uh, number of instructions ready for ex execution is having enough up active warps inside the GPU core. The thing is that we cannot always have the maximum number of active warps inside the GPU core, right? Um, because there is, there is obviously a limitation uh, for the number, the maximum number of warps inside the GPU core. Any idea what's this limitation? Don't think about any program. Just think about the architecture. Think about the fine green multi-threaded architecture. We can have up to a maximum number of warps. Uh, no, actually not, because uh, instruction cache, cache is, not a, is not a problem because all these warps are running the same program. So one of the things, if you uh, review the slides that I showed you the other day, one of the things that determine what's the maximum number of threads 
in a generic fine-grained multi-thread architecture or maximum number of warps um, in, in, in the GPU is the number of PCs that you have, the number of program counters that you have. Because as you can see, all these guys here, these four warps, are running the same program. But at a particular point in time, they are on a different instruction, right? So here is instruction four for warp zero, here is instruction one for warp three. So each of them needs its own program counter. In the end, a program counter is a register, and we have a maximum number of registers inside, I mean, program counters inside the, inside the GPU core. So that's essentially what limits what's the maximum number of warps that we can have inside each of the GPU cores. But then there are more limitations, right? Because depending on the program, the number of resources, the different resources that these different warps need is different. That will depend on the program. We might have programs where we need, let's say, two registers per thread. That will depend on you know, how good our compiler is as well. But OK, let's say um, uh, two registers per thread. So if we have uh, warps of 32 threads, this, this means uh, 64 registers per warp. Um, but there are also there are other programs where we might need uh, four registers per thread. So in that case, is twice the number of registers that we need. And obviously, the total number of registers that we have inside the GPU core, the size of this register file, is also limited, by, right? And the same happens as well with the uh, shared memory. The shared memory, this is scratchpad memory inside the GPU core, uh, has certain size, typically 64 kilobytes. And these 64 kilobytes need to be uh, assign, I mean, they need to be partitioned and assigned to the different thread blocks that are going to be mapped uh, onto the, uh, the, the uh, GPU core. You see, so these are typical values for the SM, for the GPU core resources. Maximum number of warps, 64, which is related to the maximum number of program counters. Maximum number of uh, blocks per SM, it has also its own uh, limitation, is 32. Register usage, the, the, the size of the register file is uh, 256 kilobytes, typically. And for the shared memory usage is uh, 64 uh, kilobytes. So depending on what's the uh, usage of these resources that each individual thread and each individual thread block does, we can have more or less thread blocks and warps running at the same time inside the GPU core, right? So now imagine, uh, for your program, each thread block needs to use 30 kilobytes. How many uh, blocks can you run inside the same SM? Only two, right? So if I have four SMs in my GPU, I could be actually running eight blocks at the same time. If my program in the execution configuration, I launch 200 thread blocks, I can only launch, so I can only have eight, and then eight, and then eight. For sure, the GPU has a very smart uh, thread scheduler, and as soon as one of these thread blocks finishes, completes its execution, there is a free slot, and the thread scheduler is going to map, is going to uh, put there and, and start running a new block, right? And that's. Uh, and that's how it's uh, going to, to work. Also observe that this occupancy, which essentially you, you had actually the definition in the previous slide, is a, the occupancy is like the percentage of active threads, active warps that we have. Um, this occupancy for the same program might also change depending on what's the actual platform. Why is that? Because if you compare different generations of GPUs, you will see that these numbers have changed a little bit over time, typically increasing, right? That's for sure. Okay, so yeah, so these are the things that you have to take into account when you want to do, uh, to, to, to do the uh, occupancy calculation. And in principle, one of the basic rules for optimizations of uh, GPU programs is to try to increase the occupancy. 
in the end, it's not uh, always like a very good practice. For example, if uh, your workload is very, very memory bound, you have many, many accesses to uh, global memory. Um, it might be good to actually reduce the occupancy a, a, a little bit because this way we won't put so much pressure on the interconnect and on the memory subsystem. But yeah, as let's say as an um, initial um, uh, good practice for uh, GPU optimization, increasing the occupancy uh, tends to be a good thing. But in the end, it's a lot of exploration as well. Writing your program, trying different number of threads per block, trying um, um, different um, execution configurations and, and play with these uh, numbers quite a bit. Okay, uh, second uh, important consideration for the memory access is the memory coalescing. What does it exactly mean? Um, yeah, what well, this means that when accessing global memory, we should try to make sure that concurrent threads access nearby memory locations. That's, uh, let's say, like the most basic definition of memory coalescing. And this uh, is actually the way of achieving uh, peak bandwidth, is when all threads inside a warp access one single cache line. Um, uh, yeah, so the size of the cache line and the uh, typical values of the uh, cache line size in the L1 is 128 bytes. In L2 is uh, 32 bytes. But if you, if you think about, so in, what this means is that every time that we, L1 requests uh, one cache line, it's actually four cache lines in L2. And actually, if you think about 128 bytes, what does it mean for a single warp? That means four bytes per thread, right? And four bytes is one single precision floating point or uh, an integer, right? So that's like reasonable thing, right? Reasonable values. So uh, what's uh, coalesced memory access? It will be something like this. So for example, I could write a program where I assign this entire row to thread one and I assign this entire row to thread two or I can write my program like that. I can assign one, this column to thread one and this column to thread two. What's the difference between them? The difference is that when these two threads start the execution of the program, first thing to do is to read this element and this element. And it, if you look at these two elements, they are too far away. How much? Depending on this stride, this width of the matrix. So if this stride, is, this matrix is very small, okay, that's okay, these two might be even in the same cache line, right? But if this is, I don't know, 2,000 elements, then for sure, thread one and thread two will be accessing, will be reading different cache lines. However, if I assign the computation in this way, thread one here, thread two here, these two elements are consecutive, so they belong to the same cache line. Right? What's going to be the difference? The difference is that for the same access, here I need two memory transactions, while here I only need one memory transaction. So that's the way of doing the coalesced access and to have peak bandwidth in this uh, memory access. This is uh, a little bit more detail about what an uncoalesced memory access is. Imagine that I assign the uh, rows to individual threads. So yeah, in this case, it's uh, matrix is only four times four, but now imagine that it's 4,000 times 4,000. So uh, when, when we talk here about time period, in, in reality, we want to talk about iteration. So in the first iteration, thread one reads this, thread two reads this, thread three reads this, and these three are very far away, different cache lines. So I need three, actually four memory transactions to satisfy this memory request, this first load instruction. Uh, in the second iteration, I access the next element, so this is again four memory transactions. Good thing is that, at least these days, GPUs have reasonable caches, reasonable size, so it's likely that in this second iteration, this thread one can directly fetch this from L1, right? But yeah, in the past this was uh, worse, but still it's a, it's a very uh, important uh, performance consideration. 
And in the coalesced memory access, what I do is assigning um, uh, threads to the columns uh, in, in this case. So this way, in the first iteration, I have consecutive threads accessing consecutive elements. So in the same iteration, I only need to fetch maybe one cache line if this, uh, this, this is a warp, let's say, and each of these is four bytes, so it's one single cache line. Uh, if it's a double precision, it will be two cache lines that are one after the other second iteration, and so on. And actually, you can see here uh, what's the difference between, so it's, it's, it's important, right? Recall that slide talking about the disadvantages of CND processing, uh, and one of the things that the, that uh, uh, text, says, uh, text says is that, um, yeah, so you, you, need to be, um, you need to be smart when you organize data, when you arrange data inside memory to make it more um, CMD friendly, let, let's say, and in this case, it's GPU friendly. And actually, these are two different ways of organizing, uh, in this case, uh, uh, an array of structures or a structure of arrays. The data is exactly the same, so we have two possibilities here. Uh, this is like, uh, so this truck here contains four arrays. This is A, B, C, and D. And here what we have is that each of the, so in, in total this is an array of structures, and in each struct we have elements of A, B, C, and D, right? So if you think about this and you think about the typical pro program, what is more favorable, what is more desirable for GPUs? This thing, right? Because if I have multiple threads operating on this, I will have, in the beginning of my program, I want my threads to access elements of A, so I will have thread zero here, one, two, three, four, and so on, right? So they are accessing consecutive memory locations belonging to the same cache line. While here, there is already a stride between these accesses, so more likely that I will need more memory transactions, right? And actually, you can see in the next slide a comparison of, uh, you know, accessing um, these uh, kind of organizations. What we have changed here is the uh, structure size, uh, and this uh, is for, um, th this is like, uh, um, so this could be like the array of structure. The longest, the structure size, I have more, longer stride across threads, so you see how the throughput, how the, uh, sustain, the, the achieved bandwidth is going down very, very quickly, right? However, if you compare that to a CPU, it's uh, kind of different. I mean, in the CPU, it looks like uh, not so more uh, uh, irregular there, but, but, but you see that in general, uh, CPUs uh, are fine with having uh, larger structures. And why is that? Because in CPUs you typically have one single thread or maybe two threads or something like that. Each of them has its individual cache. So if uh, I have uh, my thread uh, reading this element, I will bring all this data to the, to the cache and next I, I will have uh, heat in the cache when accessing the rest of elements of the structure. Yeah, you can find more details about this kind of analysis in this paper. Okay, next thing, what time is it? Uh, yeah, I think we can have a break, no? Let's have a 10 minute break. Is that okay? Okay, any questions so far? Or any more questions? Okay. Okay, I think we can continue, are you ready? Okay, next thing, data reuse. We are going to discuss now how to uh, make use of this um, scratchpad memory, this shared memory that we have inside uh, each of the GPU cores. Um, observe, for example, this uh, image here and that green tile that we have there. So if you think, for example, about you know, the typical filters that are applied in image processing, but not only in image processing, also in uh, deep neural networks, uh, these uh, convolutional layers usually do something like that. Uh, we typically have a filter, and the filter is uh, you know, something like this uh, Gauss thing, is like, you know, like a small um, uh, 
data structure, two-dimensional data structures with uh, certain values, and, and we need to calculate the convolution for uh, the uh, pixel image, the, the pixel, um, the image pixels that uh, that are, let's say, covered by this um, this green window that represents the filter. So, yeah, the computation that we need to do for each of the individual pixels is going to be something like that. This is like the uh, sequential code for um, for this uh, particular, in these cases, uh, as I said, called Gaussian filtering. So, but now if you uh, think about what's the uh, computer, so, so, yeah, so that's the thing. What we are doing here is accessing all these nine elements here and uh, we take the nine elements from the image, we take the nine elements from the, um, um, from the filter, and then uh, we do the computation. But now if you think about what's the computation that needs to be applied for this pixel here, it's, uh, it's actually the same thing, but instead of being these nine elements here, it's going to be with this window here, with this window of nine elements here. So the thing is that there is a lot of reuse across the threads that are computing on these two pixels, right? In particular, out of the nine elements, there are six of the elements that are shared. And that's the data reuse, and that's what we have to take advantage of. We don't want to go again to the uh, global memory, which takes us uh, several hundred cycles to fetch a cache, a cache line uh, in order to do the computation. If we read this for thread one, we want to reuse it quickly for thread zero, right? So what we do typically when we have this kind of computation, what we do is tiling, which essentially means that we divide the entire image in this case into uh, pieces, chunks, tiles of a certain size, and each of these tiles is in the GPU programming model, typically going to be um, assigned to one entire thread block. So now uh, think about a thread block of four threads, two-dimensional thread block of four threads. Here, this is thread zero, zero, this is zero, one, one, zero, and one, one, computing on for, for uh, you know, the filter for filter output for these four pixels. So these four threads will need to read all these values from DRAM and stored in somewhere where they can be accessed much faster. And this somewhere is the shared memory, is the scratch pad memory. And, and, and this is something that the controller, so the, the programmer can control itself. For that, we will need to declare uh, some uh, uh, yeah, array in the shared memory, in this case is L data, local data of uh, this size. And, uh, and then we will have to synchronize. Why do we need to synchronize? We need to synchronize to make sure that we have finished loading the entire tile into the shared memory. And then we can run the computation directly reading the piece of the image, the tile of the image from the shared memory, right? Again, back to the reason why we need to synchronize. It will be because typically this thread block is going to be composed by multiple warps. And as you know, the way that warps are scheduled is you know, independently of each other. So if I have, let's say, okay, let's assume in this example, let's assume that my warps have two threads. So here I have two warps, right? So um, these two warps need to go and read the entire thing. Warp zero will be reading, for example, this part, warp one, we'll be reading this part. And the only way to know that both finished loading from global memory into the shared memory is by using this local barrier, these sync threads. That's why we need to use it. OK? Yeah, so this is an example of uh, using the shared memory. It's a you know, typical. Um, typical case of uh, usage of the shared memory. But the shared memory has also its own uh, considerations, performance considerations. Why is that? Because the shared memory is a banked memory. It has multiple banks, typically 16 or 32, which actually is a number that is you know, related to what's the warp size. So the perfect uh, access to the shared memory by a warp, what is it? How is it determined? You already know 
how multibanked or interleaved memories work, right? We want to avoid bank conflicts. We, want to have, we don't want to have two accesses to the same bank because this way, the, what will happen is that the accesses are serialized. So if we have a warp of 32 threads, what's the ideal situation? We have each thread accessing each bank, right? So that's what we uh, should try to, to have. Each bank can service one address per cycle. You already know that. Typically, 32 banks, which is in line with the, or, or related to the number of threads in the warp. And the way that uh, these addresses are mapped into the banks is something like this. 32 is the number of banks. We already uh, saw this expression in the, um, in the, uh, in the, other, the previous lecture. OK. And this is interesting as well. Bank conflicts are only possible within a warp, right? Makes sense, right? Because the access to the shared memory is scheduled at a different time. That's for sure. So warp zero and warp one cannot have conflicts. The, the, the actual conflicts happen inside the warp among the threads uh, that belong to the same warp. Uh, some some uh, example patterns. Um, Bank conflict three. In this uh, particular case, we have 16 threads, and we have 16 threads and 16 banks. Um, yeah, if our stride is if stride is one, we have linear addressing. Then no bank conflicts. What's the access here? Let's say your array A with A0, A1, A2, A3, at, at, up to A16, for example. I have 16 threads, so thread zero accesses. A0, which is located in bank zero, thread one accesses A1, which is located in bank one, and so on. The width of these banks is four bytes, which also matches very well with the cache line size. You recall that, right? This is another example as well. We don't need to always have linear addressing. We can also have random addressing or different addressing. The only important thing is that they all these 16 threads belonging to the same warp are accessing different banks each. This way, we will, we will be able to exploit the maximum bandwidth of the shared memory. Uh, yeah, this is an example of n-way bank conflicts. For example, two-way bank conflicts. When does, does it happen? When we have a strike two, for example, we have thread zero accessing A0, thread one accessing A2, Thread three accessing, so thread two accessing A4, and so on. This is what is going to happen when we write in our code A2 times thread ID. If we do that, then this thread is two, right? And if this thread is two, we are going to have two way bank conflict. And think about that. We have two threads going to the same bank, which means that we are reducing the effective bandwidth by two and can be, of course, even worse. This is an eight-way bank conflict. So how can we reduce the shared memory bank conflicts? Of course, the, uh, lay the, the layout is very important, right? But you know, in some cases, we might need to have thread zero accessing element zero and thread one accessing element two. This might happen. Why is that? Because that's a computation that I I need to carry out, or I want to carry out. So there are optimization techniques that we can apply, being the simplest one, uh, padding. Let me give you an example of padding here using the, uh, the blackboard. If I can find what I need. Okay, um, yeah, so imagine that, you will see, it's actually uh, very simple. Imagine that this is our shared memory. This is bank zero. This is bank one, bank two, and this is bank 31. So I need my, my threads accessing something like this. 
a red id x dot x which means that I'm going to have thread 0 accessing here, thread 1 accessing here, and so on, right? So what's going to be the problem here? The problem is that I have a two-way bank conflict. And why is that? Because I'm going to have one thread accessing here, which is which thread? Thread 16, right? So is this unavoidable? Of course it is, if we write the program that way, because we really need sec thread 16 access uh, this element 32. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, these are the characteristics. This is the way that data is mapped. This is the way that data is, uh, the addresses are mapped onto the banks, and this is the way that uh, threads access uh, the shared memory. Recall that the specific bank where one address is allocated is this, right? This address modulo 32. What can I do that? What, what can I do here? Uh, what's, uh, what's, uh, what, what is what padding means? Padding essentially means that I'm going to reserve extra memory um, locations for nothing, simply to avoid the bank conflict. What I could do is simply not use this and store A32 here. This would be A33, and so on. And in the next row, let's say, the padded position is going to be this one. So the good thing is that this thread 16, instead of accessing here, is going to access here, in bank one, where no one else is accessing. Right? So I avoid the bank conflict, and now I have uh, I can get the maximum bandwidth from the shared memory. That's essentially the padding thing. Of course, this uh, can also change. There might be other ways of, of doing it, but uh, that's the, the main idea. Is it clear? Okay. Yeah, go down. Okay. Yeah, there, there have, uh, there, there have uh, also been like uh, different uh, proposals to deal with uh, bank conflicts as well. I think that we already, I already mentioned um, this uh, randomized mapping uh, from this paper from Bob Rao in ISCA 2000, uh, so in ISCA 1991, uh, pseudo randomly interleaved memory. Um, that's uh, so essentially the idea here is to use uh, hash functions that do the mapping in a different way instead of having a linear mapping like uh, address modulo 32 uh, we can have like more uh, complex addressing and if this addressing is handled by the hardware the overhead of it is is negligible and and, and you can get a lot of uh, a lot of uh, performance improvement. And, and this is actually uh, something like that, but specifically applied apply to GPUs. Um, yeah. So yeah, in, in general, actually, if you take a look at this, at this work, you will see that the different functions that are being used here that I actually configure for the specific instructions, for the specific uh, GPU programs, you will see that the, the impact that they have in the overall performance is, uh, is really, really good. Problem of using these hash functions, problem of using these uh, fancy addressing is that you as a programmer cannot reason very easily about what is happening. So because, you know, you, you, you may always have some, uh, let's say, uh, you, know, you know, like um, 
uh, corner cases where where you really uh, still detect, uh, for example, when you do uh, when you do profiling of, of your program, you still detect that there are bank conflicts. But now you don't really know how the data is uh, is mapped onto the bank, so it's much more uh, difficult to reason and try to solve it your way. <coughs> Usually, that won't happen so frequently, right? So yeah, but uh, yeah, in the end, uh, things like padding can be uh, pretty useful in these cases. Okay, uh, we are already done with the um, things related to memory access. We've talked about um, efficient access to global memory, trying to use uh, coalesced memory accesses, uh, efficient data reuse, taking advantage of the shared memory, and also uh, what to keep in mind if we want to really have an efficient access to the shared memory. And now let's gonna talk about the, the pipeline itself, like uh, about the, the SIMD utilization. The other day we already um, introduced the problem that we might have with the SPMD model. The good thing of the SPMD model is that I I can write whatever I want. I can use control flow um, statements, for example, and I can have thread zero going this way and thread one going this other way. You have a, um, a clear uh, example here, branch and two different paths, A and B, depending on, you know, for example, the value of a data read from memory or depending on the uh, index of the, of the specific thread, we will go through path A or path B. And the problem here is that this produces branch divergence and branch divergence translate into warp diver divergence, intra-warp divergence. And why is that a problem? A problem? It's a problem because, uh, you know, the, the 32 threads of the warp are issued at the same time. So they, you, we, we have the warp scheduler, uh, which reads, uh, one, fetches one instruction from the instruction cache and then launches uh, the 32 uh, threads uh, over the, on the, on the um, eight SIMD lanes or 32 SIMD lanes or whatever number that we have. So they execute in lockstep. Ideally, they are going to be execute uh, executing the entire instruction uh, together over the, the whole pipeline, and that can be very efficient, as you can see the first instruction here in this, in this picture, but if we have a branch, then part of them will go through one path, the other part will go through the other path, and the thing is that essentially we need twice the number of cycles to do the, to do the computation here, right? So, um, so yeah, so uh, can we avoid that? Well, uh, the other day we uh, saw some, a couple of uh, proposals to deal with that from the hardware point of view, but unfortunately current GPUs still don't implement so uh, these fancy proposals. So um, what we can try to do is uh, you know, figure out how to write our programs in a nicer way to avoid these kind of programs. Um, so yeah, give me, let me give you uh, a, a better example of, uh, I mean, or let's say on code, what's an example of intra-warp divergence, something like this, for example, we have, uh, we do some computation here, um, and in principle, there is no divergence um, in, in, in this uh, initial part, but then at some point we have this if-else if statement, and now we want that, you know, odd, uh, so even threads uh, do this and odd threads do that. Um, this will be something uh, like this in the, in the execution. If I have wars with, two, uh, with 32 threads and these uh, 32 threads uh, are... Um, Executing these compute instructions together, perfect, 100% utilization, that's fine. But then um, we want uh, odd, uh, so even threads do, the, do this in the if part, the odd threads um, in the else part, right? So the problem here is that half of the warp is unused here, the other half of the warp, the warp is unused here, right? Can we do something here? Okay, so this is a possibility. Divergence-free execution. I change the mapping of threads to the data. And, and now, instead of having, you know, even threads doing this and odd threads doing that, now what I have is the 32 threads. I divide them, or I mean, in this case, yeah, consider that we have more than two warps, let's say, um, 64 threads, for example. What I'm gonna do is that the computation that should be assigned to 64 threads is going to be divided into what was done by the 
um, event threats now is going to be done by the um, threats in the first warp, and what was done by the odd threats now is going to be done by the threats in the next warp. So something like this. Uh, when we uh, reach the if-else statement, the if part is computed by these guys here, while the else part is computed by these guys here. And if these two parts belong to different warps, then I no longer have divergence. And I can have 100% um, um, SIMD utilization. This is obviously nothing, right? Because you don't know what is do this and do that. But now I'm going to give you an actual example that is a very nice one and very useful primitive uh, in, uh, GP in general in, in parallel computing is uh, vector reduction. Vector reduction is that I have a vector, 12 elements in this case, and what I want to know is what's the total sum of these 12 elements. How can I do this? You know, you might know that for um, vector reduction on a parallel machine, what we typically do is what is called a tree-based approach. Essentially, uh, several steps, log n steps, being n the size of the array, and in each step, I have one thread adding up two elements. For example, in my naive mapping, I have thread zero adding elements zero and one, thread two adding elements two and three, thread four adding elements four and five, and so on. This is naive, but it's the most straightforward way of doing it, right? I mean, of course, after this lecture, after these slides, you will always think on, on the right way of doing it if you have to uh, program this or something similar to this on a GPU. But this is like the most straightforward way and the, most, the easiest way for a programmer to write this. The problem here is that as we uh, make progress over the iterations, the number of threads gets reduced, which makes sense, obviously, because I don't have so many elements to add in each iteration. But observe that these threads are iteration after iteration uh, farther away from each other. Actually, from the very beginning, I, I only have here thread 0 and thread 2 computing, and thread 1 and thread 3 are doing nothing. So even in the first iteration, I already have 50% SIMD utilization. Right? So, um, and this is the uh, naive mapping. Observe that this uh, really uh, simple program, right? So uh, here I have a variable T that represents the uh, thread index. And now uh, over the iterations, I start increasing the stride, right? So uh, here for thread zero, the stride between the two elements that needs to add is only one. In the next iteration, the stride is two. In the next iteration, the stride is four. In the next iteration, the stride is eight. So that's what I have in this code here, right? You, I, I, I start increasing the, the, the stride from, warp, from one until block uh, dimension. Yeah, don't, don't really worry about the, the limit for, for I mean, the, the, the end of the for loop for the example, but the point is that the stride is being doubled in every iteration, right? So if, uh, if you are the, the, the thread that you have to be, then you perform this partial reduction. Problem, very low CIND utilization. So how can I come up with a divergence-free mapping? Well, in the case of the reduction, is something uh, really possible because reduction typically is an associative operation, right? So think about the, the sum, think about the addition. I don't really care about, because of the associative proper property, uh, associative and commutative properties, I don't really care about what's the order of the, of the additions, right? I don't really have to add the first zero and one and then two and three and so on. And um, so, yeah, so what I can do here is assign uh, the input data to the threads in a different manner. And this way I can have consecutive threads working over the uh, whole execution of the program. So, for example, here to thread zero, I assign in the very first iteration element zero and 16 to thread one elements one and 17. And this way, 
one first benefit of this is if you look at if you look at the memory access is that for sure I'm going to have coalesced accesses, and uh, and second benefit from this is that I have consecutive threads working. So if this instead of being 16 is 32 threads, the 32 threads belong to the same warp, right? In this example, for example, uh, in this example, you can uh, maybe think about a thread block of 16 warps and think about warps of four threads. So if this is a thread block of 16 warps, I have the four warps working in the very beginning. In the next iteration, half of the warps retire, but the other half of the warps continue working. And inside each of these warps, so if, if this is one single warp, Inside each of these warps, or in this particular uh, warp, I have 100% utilization because all the threads of the warp are active. And then I continue, and so on. Yeah, in the very end, obviously, I don't have 100% utilization, but that's simply because the reduction uh, is uh, with less than, the, the rest of the reduction is with less than 32 elements. And uh, yeah, if you look at the code, I will let you uh, think about it yourself. But if you look at the code, this might be a little bit more difficult, complex, the addressing. But in the end, it's not, uh, it's not that difficult. And, um, and yeah, so with this, I can achieve uh, higher SIMD utilization. So it's a nice example of uh, divergence free mapping. Any question? Okay, next thing, atomic operations. Recall uh, atomic operations. I mentioned in the beginning the problem with atomic operations is I have threads uh, running concurrently, right? And if these threads inside the same warp need to update atomically the same memory location, I will have to serialize the accesses. Yeah, that's something that uh, is going to happen for sure, but there might also ways of uh, optimizing it. Um, yeah, so this is the syntax for an atomic operation in high-level CUDA programming language, uh, atomic add, uh, where I have one uh, element in memory, I have a pointer here, and uh, in this memory uh, position, I want to add this integer in this case. I mean, this is for... Yeah, the syntax for integers, but they also work for floating point, double precision, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, in, in, in CUDA, as you know, there is a compiler as well, and this compile takes your CUDA program and compiles it to the, you know, ones and zeros that the machine understands, right? But there is also an intermediate representation that is very useful, uh, that is called PTX. And the reason why this PTX exists is because the architecture has changed over time, right? So, and you want to have the same program. The same program that you wrote 10 years ago should also work uh, in 2019. Um, so uh, that is why there is a kind of uh, intermediate uh, representation or an intermediate layer in the compilation um, in the compilation flow, um, that is this uh, called PTX. This is common for all uh, GPUs, but then you can go to the a specific um, um, assembly code that is called SAS for the different architectures. Actually, if you look at the, the you read the PTX, you see that this is kind of uh, simple to understand, right? So this is an atomic operation on shared memory, it's an atomic add on unsigned 32, four bytes, right? And this is the output. Typically, what this atomic add returns is the old value of this memory location. So this is the output register in register 25. This is the address um, in this RD14, the address in shared memory that we are updating, and this is the value that we are adding. So how does this uh, translate to the SAS code, to the assembly code, that is the thing that is actually executed on the, on the GPU hardware? Uh, yeah, in the case, so it, it, it has been a, a, a change here. 
and 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 that's actually um, something nice that shows uh, how much um, you know um, improvements in the hardware can impact the the overall performance of of programs in the in the Initial architectures, uh, Tesla, Fermi, and Kepler, these atom chair add uh, what was uh, compiled into this small loop. If you look at the loop, what you have here is a load instruction, then an addition, then a store instruction, and then a branch, right? And also, if you look at this, you can see that there are something here, these P0 and P1, which are predicate registers. You remember, we have talked about predicated execution, right? So essentially, this predicate register is one single bit per thread. That's enough, one single bit per thread. And what we are going to have here is zero or one, depending on the, the, you know, the, uh, on, on the fact that the thread succeeded or not while trying to lock the access to the particular position, particular location in the global memory, in the, local, in the shared memory in this case. So if we have two threads belonging to the same warp and they both want to update the same location, they have to contend for one lock. I don't need to say where these locks are. You can guess where they are inside the, the shared memory. Uh, so they contend and only one of them um, can uh, actually yeah, gain the access and lock the access to the, to the specific uh, memory uh, location. And this gives us this uh, predicate value. So if the, your predicate is one, you will actually execute this and this. And if it's not, then you will jump and start from the beginning. The reason why they changed this is because this was very inefficient, right? Imagine, for example, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, you are, I don't know, counting elements that are equal to 16 in a, in a whole array. And you want to count, and the easiest way of counting, the fastest way of writing your code is saying, okay, let's use um, atomic operation. So I, check, I read from memory, is this equal to 16 or not? If it's equal to 16, then I update, right? I add one to this uh, shared memory location. Yeah, so in the end, you have one single address that is being accessed by all the threads using uh, atomic operations. So imagine that your six, the, the 16 threads in the warp have read 16 from memory. So the, 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 the 32 of them will have to go over this thing 32 times. So the number of instructions that you're executing here is very high, right? T uh, four times 32. Uh, yeah. NVIDIA improved the implementation of this since the Maxwell architecture. We have uh, native atomic instructions in shared memory, and, uh, <clears throat> and they are way more uh, efficient, way, way faster. Yeah, this is a little bit more uh, elaboration on the example that I just gave you, right? So in this case, we have these thread zero and thread one, which are going to, if they update different elements and, and also in different banks, because of course, if this is shared memory, we also have bank conflicts when executing uh, atomic operations. If they are, you know, updating two different positions in the, um, in the inside the same bank, we, we will still have uh, atomic uh, so bank conflicts. So we have these. Uh, if the access is something like that, then we clearly need. Uh, um, yeah, an extra latency, serialized updates. And this is something that uh, actually, I mean, I first gave you like a very naive example. Let's count how many elements are equal to 16. But um, this is actually like very uh, typical thing that happens in, in some uh, useful primitives, like for example, uh, histogram calculation. You might be familiar with histograms. They are uh, used in many, many different applications, especially in image and video processing. Um, and one way of um, assigning the computation of an histogram, I mean, the, the, let's say the typical way of assigning the, the computation of a histogram across threads is doing something like this. This is your input image. 
these are the different pixels. And uh, yeah, I will typically have thread zero reading this, thread one reading this, thread two reading this. Why is that? Because in the end, what I'm doing here is, is very little amount of computation. So most of the thing is going to be, most of the cycles are going to be spent on reading the image from the global memory. So I want to, I need to, um, you know, try to have efficient access to memory, big bandwidth, co-less memory accesses, and if I want that, I will have to do this assignment. And now the thing is, if these guys here need to update this histogram in global memory, or maybe, um, yeah, in principle in global memory, I might have two of these inside the same warp updating the same bin of the histogram. So that's gonna be an atomic conflict, right? And this entails serialization, and the performance of the uh, program might go uh, down very quickly. And this is very frequent in uh, uh, histogram computation of natural images. Why is that? Because this pixel here is very likely that they have the same value, right? So for example, uh, these uh, threads are reading all these pixels, and these two are reading pixels with value 192. And the distance between these two pixels is two. So for sure they're gonna, or very likely going to belong to the same uh, warp, right? So this will entail the, the serialization. Uh, so one way of uh, dealing with the, all the possible conflicts that we have when updating, when generating this histogram is doing a very simple but effective, effective te uh, technique that is called privatization. The example that I'm giving you here is a very naive thing, is for histogram calculation, but this privatization is also, for example, applied to graph processing when you follow what is called a top-down approach. I don't know how familiar you are with graph processing. I don't really need to uh, explain so much about that, but you know, in, in graph processing, there are essentially two ways of doing uh, graph processing. One way is doing uh, top down and the other way is doing bottom up. The difference is that you know that graph processing algorithms are typically uh, iterative, so um, you go over the graph. Uh, the, let's say, in principle, the, the, the way to be faster is by doing a top down approach in which you only need to, in each iteration, you only need to worry about the frontier, meaning the vertices or the nodes of the graph that you need to visit in this particular iteration, right? Um, the other approach is bottom-up. Bottom-up means that you're always checking all the vertices of the graph. And what you try to do is say, okay, I, I, I've been assigned this vertex. Uh, am I in the frontier or not? If I'm not in the frontier, I don't do anything. If I'm in the frontier, I do something. Problem is, if I have, uh, I don't know, a graph of uh, 100 million elements, I will need 100 million threads, and many of them will be idle most of the time. Why is that? Because they are not in the frontier, right? So that's the problem of a bottom-up. In, 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 in theory, it's more desirable to have a top-down approach in which I make progress and I only have threads exploring the nodes in the frontier. But the, point, the, point, the, the problem here is that this frontier will be typically a queue, and if I want to enqueue a new vertex into the frontier, I will have to update some uh, global uh, share, or I mean, when I say global or share, what I mean is an atomic variable that I need to update so that I get a new index to enqueue in, in the queue. This is only an example of uh, usage of uh, atomic operations and uh, privatization, because if I map this top-down approach to uh, a GPU, I could have privatization, like small queues assigned to each of the thread blocks, such that each thread block only needs to update its own queue, and at the very end of the kernel, I will merge all the small queues. So, this is uh, privatization, and this is what we can also do for uh, histogram computation. Instead of having one single histogram for all the thread blocks that I'm gonna run, one single histogram in a global memory, I can have multiple sub-histograms of the same size, as you see in this case, like uh, four beans, of the same size in the different 
share memories in the different um, um, SMs. And when I'm done, when I'm done with creating these subhistograms, I merge them into a final histogram in global memory. And this is a reduction. Recall the reduction. You already know how to do very efficient reduction, right? That, what, what we have seen before. Yeah, so this is a way of dealing with, uh, you know, alleviating what's the cost of these uh, atomic operations. Any question? Okay. Okay, uh, next thing, data transfers between CPU and GPU. Recall that this is uh, one of the main um, overheads uh, that we have in, the, in, in, the, in GPU uh, computation, one of the main bottlenecks. Why is that? Because we typically in the traditional accelerator model, we have the CPU, we have the GPU, in the middle we have a PCI Express, or, okay, NVLink can reach up to, I think, 25 gigabytes per second, but this is clearly one order of magnitude lower than accessing the global memory. So the problem here is that if I need to, um, I need to compute on a matrix of uh, 4K times 4K, I will have to move a lot of megabytes from the GPU me CPU memory to the GPU memory, and this takes time, right? And depending on... What, how much computation I'm going to perform on the GPU side, I will be able to amortize this cost of the data transfer or not. So, yeah, so there are, uh, let's say, um, uh, some ways of trying to deal with this. Uh, there is uh, the possibility of using asynchronous transfers uh, and what are called streams in CUDA or command queues in OpenCL. And these uh, are defined as sequences of operations that are performed perform in order. I will show you what we, means, uh, what we mean with that. In principle, as you know, as, uh, we, we need to transfer from CPU to the GPU, then do the kernel execution, then do the transfer of the results from the GPU to the CPU. So usually it's going to be the default stream is going to be something like this. These two are two sequences, so are two operations that belong to the same string because they are performed in order, right? I cannot ex start the execution of the kernel until I have finished copying the data from the CPU memory to the GPU memory, right? So if this is a matrix multiplication, first thing to do is to transfer both matrices from the CPU to the GPU memory, and then I can start the execution. So they represent, these two operations represent a single stream, the default stream. Um, the good thing is that in some cases, the data that I'm transferring in this part of the transfer is going to be computed in an independent way of the data that I'm going to transfer in the, um, uh, in the rest of this time. So the good thing is that as I have transferred, for example, some rows of matrix A and some columns of matrix B, let's say, because I, I was giving you the example of the matrix multiplication, I could actually start the computation of these dot products and start computing some of the elements, right? So what we can do is divide in the computation into multiple streams such that they are independent. These two are one stream. They are in order, you see but independent of this stream, this stream, and this stream. As soon as I'm done with this transfer, I can start the computation. And at the same time, because these two operations can be asynchronous, these two streams can be asynchronous, I can overlap the data transfer for the uh, next chunk of the computation with the actual computation of the first chunk. And by doing that, I can save a lot of time. Uh, for sure, this is something that I cannot always do. I need to know uh, my computation, I need to know my program, I need to know if I can do it or not, but uh, it's not so strange, right, that you can do it. For example, yeah, these are just like some estimates of uh, how much I can, I can save, right? So if I, if I have N streams and um, uh, execution time of the kernel is longer than the execution, I mean, the time for the transfer, uh, what I would be hiding is the transfer, right? So the only thing that I will see here is this. This is uh, TT over 
n streams is is this piece here, and then what I what I see next is this T E, right? And this is the other way around. In case that the transfers are dominant, I don't know why this happens, <laughs> but yeah, I guess that. Uh, you get the point. Obviously, from doing these, from, from dividing the computation in multiple streams, there is a little overhead of managing of the, uh, uh, this thing, but yeah, in principle, it's, um, it's really worth trying. And uh, as I said, it will depend on the specific computation, but yeah, for example, video processing, this is very very good use case for... Uh, for this overlapping of communication and computation, you have a sequence of frames here. So if you need to compute on the frames uh, individually on each of the frames of the video, uh, you will need to transfer the entire video and then compute. But if you do this um, stream processing or stream execution, you can transfer a chunk of frames. And while you are computing on this chunk of frames, you can uh, transfer the next chunk of frames and you save all this amount of time. Okay? Clear? Good thing is that over time, well, yeah, you see this is from 2012, over time this, uh, this has improved and, uh, and these days um, NVIDIA provides something that is called OpenCL as well, uh, both CUDA and, 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 um, and OpenCL provides something that is called the unified memory and actually with this unified memory uh, the GPU can request pages by itself to the CPU, to the CPU memory. And this is uh, transparently handled by the driver. So you don't really need to, I mean, of course, it has a little bit more overhead uh, that you can, could control yourself if you, if you do it uh, manually. But uh, yeah, these transfers can now be, or this overlapping can these days be achieved in a completely uh, transparent way. Um, yeah, and this is the summary of uh, what we have seen so far. Is that okay? Shall we continue? 20 more minutes. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, collaborative computing. Are these uh, new features, they, let's say, started to be available in uh, CUDA maybe uh, two or three years ago? And uh, what they enable us is to have like a a tighter collaboration between the CPU and the GPU. Or if we talk about OpenCL, a tighter collaboration between the CPU and other devices, which could be two GPUs or one GPU and one FPGA or you know, multiple uh, combinations like that. Um, we can very, very first review um, uh, what we have just seen. Actually, this is like a typical uh, program Notice that we have here uh, CUDA malloc. So we have first malloc for the input array in the host, CUDA malloc for the input array in the device. Then we transfer from the host to the device, and then we allocate the output, and then we launch the kernel. We have this CUDA device synchronized. Recall that this is the way that we can make sure that, um, uh, that, that, that this kernel has finished before we do something else. In principle, typically we don't use this thing, if, if the structure of the program is like that, we don't use this thing because this CUDA main copy uh, is uh, synchronous in the way that it will never happen before the execution of, uh, of the kernel. But there is also one CUDA main copy async, which is the one that we have to use for uh, the CUDA streams. And in that case, um, yeah, th this and this will be asynchronous. So if we really want to make sure that this finish, then we need to use this. Okay, a small uh, clarification that you don't really need. But yeah, so what's the, what's the problem that we have here? The problem that we have here is that uh, the actual collaboration between CPU and GPU is um, it's very difficult. And when I'm saying actual collaboration, or when I talk about collaborative execution, I, I'm talking about the CPU and the GPU using their threads to compute, indeed, to do actual work. Because if you look at this model, what we are doing is simply the CPU thread, the only thing that it's doing is offloading the computation to the GPU and waiting for the GPU to finish, right? So during all this time, the CPU thread is doing nothing. The GPU cores are doing nothing, at least related to the CPU cores, sorry, are doing nothing at least related to this program. I could somehow try to get 
benefit or use these CPU threads by, for example, writing some computation here, right? I could, I don't know, like a very uh, naive thing. Imagine that um, I need to do two vector, uh, so one vector addition. And my array, my input array has, or my two input arrays have one million elements. And I know that the GPU is much more powerful for parallel computation than the CPU, but the CPU can also do some of the work, right? So I could say, okay, one million elements, let, let's assign uh, 100,000 elements to the CPU, to the GPU, and the rest to the CPU. So what I could do is launch this GPU kernel for this input of 100,000 elements, and the remaining 100,000 elements are going to be added here. I could do that, yes, for sure. But it's like a very, I don't know, um, naive way of doing this collaborative execution, right? And yeah, that's fine. That is still fine in a vector addition. Why is that? Because I can clearly partition what is assigned to the CPU and what is assigned to the GPU. There is no overlap, right? But now imagine that, I don't know, I have a more complex computation where, uh, for example, a histogram calculation. I have the entire image, and I could say, okay, uh, this number, this is small number of pixels to the CPU, this large number of pixels to the GPU. But now the, pro the problem is that they both need to uh, update the same histogram, right? So, yeah, that's probably not doable, at least with one single histogram, that's for sure. So, yeah, to deal with these uh, kind of cases, um, um, yeah, we have this unified memory. I'm going to use the, the, um, the, the CUDA term, which is unified memory. In OpenCL, this also exists, and it's called shared virtual memory, but this is exactly the same thing. Uh, this unified memory was introduced in CUDA 6 for the Kepler architecture, but uh, by that time, it was simply like kind of... Uh, wrapper that uh, simply was like doing the data transfers for you, but there was no actual uh, unified memory uh, with CUDA 8 and the Pascal architecture starting, this was actually 2016, end of 2016. Um, yeah, so these two can access at the same time the same arrays, right? And the thing is that you only need to allocate once in the CPU memory, and somehow the GPU can directly access the CPU memory. Somehow means that every time that the, CP, the GPU needs to access the CPU memory, sends a page request, like a page fault. Come on, these guys <laughs> independent. Okay, so um, uh, every time that the, the, the GPU needs to read something from the CPU memory, uh, um, uh, sends a page fault to the CPU, and this page uh, four kilobytes, typically, I think it's four kilobytes, are going to be transferred uh, from the CPU memory to the GPU memory in a transparent manner. And it can also happen the other way around. For it's, it's, it's memory coherent, meaning that if uh, the GPU uh, takes these four kilobytes, modifies them, and after that the CPU needs to update whatever in these uh, four kilobytes, they will be transferred back to the CPU memory. As you can guess, this has obviously an overhead, but it's also a, a huge uh, um, jump in, in terms of programmability. Um, yeah, so this was the, uh, yeah, so in the beginning with the, the good thing of uh, using the unified memory is that now you don't need to do the double allocation that we had. We, we actually have this malloc here, but we don't really need this because this could a malloc manage Observe that now the API changed a little bit the name. Um, this CUDA malloc manage is actually allocating in both places at the same time for you. And uh, that's why we are using uh, here simply a mem copy. And, uh, and, and we don't have an actual CUDA mem copy. There is no actual explicit transfer between the um, CPU and the GPU memory. And... Um, and yeah, and this is an example of, uh, of what I told you before. Uh, in, the, in the traditional model, uh, if you want to partition these uh, vectors and, and do the comp some computation on the CPU, yeah, the CPU can do something here, right? Can do some things here. But it's not actual uh, fine-grained collaboration. 
The good thing is that with the unified memory, the way that it's already exists in Pascal, uh, Volta um, um, architectures from NVIDIA, but also on the HSA architecture from AMD and other vendors, is that you see the kernel is launched with these arguments, output and input arrays, and as soon as I launch the kernel, and this is a completely asynchronous operation, the CPU can continue computing and can directly operate on these arrays that are also being operated by the GPU kernel. And this is transparently handled. All the memory coherence here is transparently handled. So these are the APIs, um, CUDA malloc manage that you have already seen, and it's also possible to have system-wide atomic. So now it would be possible to have one single histogram that is being updated by the GPU threads and the CPU threads, for example, like using this uh, fetch at on the CPU side. On the GPU side, you would need to use this atomic at system. It's a kind of atomic at, but it's over the entire unified memory. That's why it's different from the... Uh, atomic add that we have seen before uh, for the shared memory, which also has the same syntax for the global memory. This is in OpenCL 2.0, or since OpenCL 2.0, and this is uh, C++ AMP, which is a related thing a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about this. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, kind of C++ uh, high-level high programming model. As um, In the end, it end up compiling to to OpenCL typically, and from there to the to the actual uh, assembly code. Uh, yeah, and, the, and and with these uh, collaborative patterns, uh, we can so and with these features, we are now able to uh, implement these collaborative patterns. So um, this is what you what we originally have uh, in a traditional accelerator model in the traditional program structure. We have Different, for example, two kernels, right? This is the computation that we need to carry out, right? This is kernel one, this is kernel two. And what we have in the middle is this coarse grain synchronization that is, it's, it's simply the kernel term termination and launch of a new kernel. Recall that this is the only way of doing synchronization, global synchronization uh, inside the GPU, right? So this is like the program structure. We have the, the, the entire operations that we need to, to do here can be divided into multiple tasks. You can, uh, for example, think about each of these tasks being assigned to a single thread. And actually inside these tasks, uh, we can have subtasks, I don't know, for example, yeah, uh, adding two values and, um, and, and then uh, reducing the par partial results, for example. That could be, that those could be the, the two uh, subtasks here. So, with the new um, features, it is possible to very, these new programming features, it is possible to do a very um, efficient partitioning across different devices. In this case, div device one and device two can be one CPU and one GPU. And, and you know, because these are different devices, they are better for some tasks and are better or, or, and worse for other tasks. For example, in this particular case, uh, the yellow subtask is runs faster on device one, and the and the uh, and the green one runs faster uh, on device two, right? Um, so yeah, th this is one uh, possible partitioning that I can do, right? And I would have my coarse grain synchronization, the kernel termination, and then I continue. And, and also you can see that, yeah, this, this thing is uh, faster on device one, this thing is faster on device two, right? And what I'm doing here is I'm simply assigning to each device an amount of computation that is uh, related to the compute power that I have in the, in the different devices. Maybe I have four CPU cores, and here I have 80 GPU cores. So yeah, okay, I will assign uh, many more of these tasks to the, um, to the GPU threads, right, than to the CPU threads. This could be like the most naive way of partitioning the data. But now observe that, okay, I, I clearly see that some operations are faster on the, on the CPU, while other operations are faster on the GPU. So, 
what I could do, actually, if I, if I look at this, I, first, I, I can first look at the entire task, right? Those tasks there are faster. Each individual task is faster on the GPU, while here, each individual task is faster on the CPU. So one thing I can do is some sort of coarse grain task partitioning where I run all this computation in device two and all this computation on device one, right? I could do that. And in principle, you see that in this uh, picture, you don't see any concurrency, right? You don't see uh, device one and device two operating at the same time. Right, but I could I could really do that because, for example, if I'm operating on a um, whole video stream that is composed by thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of of frames, I could be here. I could be doing this computation for the previous chunk of um, of uh, video frames. So I can have this uh, concurrency. But it could be even nicer if I do a fine-grained task partitioning, and this is something that is really doable these days with uh, these, uh, all these new programming features. I directly assign those subtasks that are faster to the device where they are faster. So the, the yellow thing in device one, the green thing in device two, and then at some point I need to uh, do a coarse green synchronization and then, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the light green thing on the CPU, the, the dark green thing on the GPU, and so on. And this communication, this synchronization, can be implemented how? Who can give me an idea of how to do this? Maybe, maybe very, uh, very late. For example, using a flag. Right. When this, I, I assign this to thread zero in the CPU, for example, and when thread zero is done with this, sets a flag in the unified memory, and in the, on the GPU side, I have, for example, a GPU thread block, checking that flag using atomic operations. That's pos possible. This uh, atomic add system that I, I just showed you. So this guy updates with an atomic operation the flag, and this guy here says, uh, sees that this flag has been set, and now the data, this data, is ready to start the execution on the um, GPU side. And as you can see, this can be very flexible, right? Because I can have uh, CPU threads and GPU threads continuously running and communicating using these new features like the uh, system-wide atomics, and, uh, which at, uh, at the same time take advantage of the memory coherence across uh, both memories. And that's more or less the, the idea here of these collaborative patterns. This is like a very uh, naive uh, example. I mean, I, I think that I already uh, men I mentioned this example. This is a histogram calculation for an image. So I assign part of the image. This would be like the traditional thing. In the traditional thing, I need to assign part of the image to the CPU, part of the image to the GPU. Each of them has its own subhistogram, and finally I need to merge them or reduce them. This can be fine, but it's a, a little bit more complex to program. It could be even much easier, actually, if they both share the same histogram in the unified memory and threads from these SMs and from these uh, CPU cores directly update uh, this histogram. Don't ask me if this is efficient or not. As you can guess, for a single histogram of, let's say, 256 bins is not efficient, but from the programming point of view, um, is, um, is actually very, very good. Um, and actually, uh, one more thing is that this is not efficient on discrete GPUs. Why is that? Because you have the PCI Express bus in the middle, right? So if uh, if you need um, these threads here, updating these, you will have to move one page from the CPU memory to the GPU memory and then back when you want these threads to update this, right? So you're going to have like this ping-ponging that is going to destroy your performance. But if you have an integrated GPU and these two things are inside the same chip and this is the same memory space, it's the same DRAM, 
then it's going to be much more efficient. And you can see uh, quite a few of uh, examples of these uh, collaborative implementation, Bessier surfaces, it's a kind of uh, um, processing for, you know, for graphics. Uh, this is on an um, NVIDIA Jetson. I don't know if you have heard about of this platform. It's like a board that contains a CPU and a GPU, CPU with uh, um, uh, four cores, four ARM cores, and a GPU with uh, two SMs. So this is the 17% 17, 17 uh, of uh, speed up that you can get from doing a collaborative execution. Uh, here you have, uh, yeah, this is a, also a performance improvement on an AMD Gaveri, which is an uh, integrated uh, uh, system and chip with uh, four CPU cores and eight GPU uh, compute units or GPU cores in AMD terminology. And here it's 45, 47% improvement over the GPU only version. Here you have a few more examples, padding, I want to go over these. Um, yeah, you can see uh, yeah, some, some, some results showing some performance improvement. This is another thing, string compaction. In this case, uh, how much? 82% improvement on this AMD Caveri on, uh, over the GPU-only implementation. What else do we have? And this is uh, breadth for search. Actually, the way that this is explained, and I cannot elaborate because we, uh, we don't have time, but you can take a look uh, by yourself. This is the top-down approach that I uh, talked about before. And you know, this applies uh, uh, several tricks, like not only privatization, but also uh, persistent thread blocks, which is also a nice way of uh, optimizing GPU programs. This, I'm going to explain you this very quickly. So uh, remember that from the beginning, I told you, you have this whole array uh, this whole array has one million elements. You're going to use thread blocks of 128 threads. So what you do is how many threads, thread blocks do I need to launch? This much, right? One million divided 128, or the ceiling of that, right? And this is the number of blocks that I have to launch. But in the end, these, uh, I don't know, 100,000 thread blocks are going to be scheduled like, uh, for example, first four, and then when we, one of these finishes, one more goes here, and then the next one goes here, and so on. So the idea of using persistent thread blocks is that I only launch, it's a little bit more complex to program, but in the end it's, it's kind of a very easy thing to understand. Instead of launching, let's say, 1,000 thread blocks, what I launch is only four thread blocks, and what I have is these four thread blocks to go over the whole array. So when thread block zero finishes with this part of the computation, instead of retiring and finishing and releasing this slot for the next thread block, what it does is going to this part here and compute this part here. And now, good thing of doing this is that, for example, I can control the uh, computation in a better way. By doing a scheme like that, I know exactly where this guy is, uh, is working on, where this guy is working on, and it might be possible to synchronize them. So it could be a way of doing uh, this um, global synchronization that is not possible um, uh, if, if, if you don't uh, deploy these uh, persistent thread blocks. But as I said, this is like uh, a little bit um, more advanced programming, let's say. Yeah, you have more uh, performance here, some results for the integrated thing. In this case, graph processing, breadth research for this uh, graph of New York roads is like 15% uh, performance improvement, some uh, sample code. It's a related thing, single source, shortest, shortest path on the AMD Gaveri, 22% performance improvement. More examples, and yeah, and this is the thing that I wanted to show you. Uh, if you want to take a look at these kind of collaborative patterns, uh, you, you, you can uh, access this uh, Chai benchmark suite where you will find many of these patterns and, and different ways of using these new programming features. And that's all for now. Uh, yeah, I hope that you found it interesting. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice weekend.